that up so that I don't get done for copyright theft of any of the images I've used. That's just being legalistic. Now what I'm going to talk about is just give you a few words about DNA. I'm kind of assuming that most of you have probably got GCSE biology, but if you haven't, then you might find this a bit hard. But I'll give a quick intro. Then I'm going to talk about uh, Neanderthals and other archaic humans, then about plague and black death. Just a few words about reconstruction of ancient environments. Now, I have a big caveat here, which is I've not had a chance to practice le this lecture. This is basically a mashup of slides from a couple of lectures I give to students, and I haven't had a chance to really remove any technical material or test it out on anyone who is just lay public, like my wife and children. So if you see anything on these slides that look overly technical and make you feel, oh, my goodness, just ignore it, close your eyes for a bit, listen to my voice instead of looking at the slides, and we'll get through the narrative of the story anyway. So DNA is a long polymer. In fact, there's an exhibition just outside that just switched off at 7 o'clock, which illustrates DNA. Uh, the outside part is a backbone, which is rather boring, but inside there are these succession of what we call bases, and the sequence of the bases encodes genetic information, and we determine that by a process that we call sequencing uh, in the laboratory. So it's like a kind of alphabet, but it just happens to have only four letters, A, C, T, and G. And what happens during evolution is that mutations occur, changes occur in that alphabet uh, within the sequence. And what we can do is we can hike out related sequences uh, from different settings, from different organisms, and we can compare them, we can align those sequences, and we can look for where there's a difference there. So those of you who've got eagle eyes there can see that there's just one change in those two sequences just here. That T has changed to an A. Now, back in 1965... Uh, Linus Pauling, who was a, a great scientist, won the Nobel Prize, he was actually the first person to say, well, actually, you could use these sequences of these informational molecules like DNA and proteins to some degree as well as a way of reconstructing evolutionary history. Um, and this would give an independent view of evolutionary history separate from what you get, say, from looking at fossils and the fossil record. And so what people do now is that they uh, draw what we call sequence-based phylogenies. Phylogeny in this context is perhaps a, a rather fancy word for evolutionary tree. And so if you're drawing a tree between humans, chimps, gorillas and orangutans, you line up the sequences. This is obviously like a toy version. You do this over millions of sequences. But uh, you pick out those sites where they vary, uh, polymorphic sites, and you count them up, and then you work out how many differences there are between each of the different sequences, and you draw a, a tree based on that. That's skating over a huge discipline in, like, two minutes. Um, but that's basically what you do. What I'm going to talk about today is actually something called ancient DNA. So we can reconstruct the evolutionary history by looking at what's in living organisms, human, chimp, gorilla, and we do comparisons. But only in the last uh, 10, 15 years have we really been able to actually get out DNA from historical or archaeological material. Um, and this gives us a direct insight into the past. There are problems. The D DNA is fairly stable, but over hundreds and thousands of years it does de degenerate into small fragments. And so actually reconstructing a whole genome of an organism from this kind of approach is quite uh, tricky. There are changes in the sequence as it degrades, and that can give us false signals, so it can look as if it's changed, when in fact it's the same uh, as, say, a modern sequence. Uh, and we've, people have had to find ways of looking for those kind of degradations and ruling them out when they're doing analyses. The big problem here is that if you're taking a bone and you're extracting bits of DNA, you're going to get very little DNA out of that bone if it's, you know... 20,000 years old or 30,000 years old, uh, and you're much more likely to contaminate that bone when you're handling it with your own DNA and other people's DNA in the laboratory setting. And so there's a huge amount of effort goes into excluding contamination, um, and you have to be very, very careful in doing the lab work. In fact, this field, when it first started, encountered something of a fiasco. There was this 
claim that someone had actually recovered dinosaur DNA. Um, but in fact, what they'd found was just an unusual form of a, of a human gene uh, that had come from the, the handlers contaminating it. So everyone in this field is extremely cautious about the way in which they do the work and the way in which they interpret it. Now I'm going to start by looking at Neanderthals. So Neanderthal is actually the name of a valley in Germany near Dusseldorf. It's um, a bit of a funny word really because it actually means New Man Valley and it's named after a, pastor, a local pastor called uh, no Joachim Neumann. For some reason they thought it was neat to turn it into Greek. I don't know why they called it in the Greek form ne Neander, but it, it was called Neanderthal. And Tal just means valley in German. Now the Germans upgraded their spelling um, in 1901 and Tal with the H in it became Tal without an H. And it's quite annoying actually. And you, if you look in the literature you see both forms used. So in America they, they think they're modern and they take out the H, we leave the H in. And if you look at Science Magazine, the way they do it, and the way Nature does it, it's quite annoying that there's no standardization uh, with that. I'm going to use the original spelling throughout from now on. So what's this all about then? Well, what um, was, was, was discovered was that, well, how it came to be discovered was that there's this uh, valley and there's a particular grotto, it's called the Kleiner Feldhof Grotto, a cave there. And in the 1850s, to sort of, uh, as a result of the industry that was growing in the region, they needed lots of limestone. So they began quarrying all that limestone. Um, and they removed the, the caves and the valley walls. And as part of that process, they discovered a skull cap and what we call postcranial bones, parts that are not the skull, 15 postcranial bones. And they were discovered in this particular grotto. It was first of all thought to be a cave bear. Um, and then it was shown to a local teacher and an natural, amateur natural historian, Fulrot. And he said, no, these are, these are human. This isn't a, a, a cave bear. And it was written up by Fulrot and, and one of his colleagues, Schaffhausen, in 1857. And so this specimen that was recovered then it was called Neanderthal I, and that became what we call the type specimen for this newly named species of Homo neanderthalensis. As it turns out, as is quite often in science, the case in science, there were actually prequels. There were things that had been discovered that belonged to this species beforehand but hadn't been recognised as a new species. Uh, there was a finding in Gibraltar in 1848 and one in Belgium in 1829. The one in Gibraltar, in fact, uh, Charles Darwin even got to see that skull and was quite impressed by the fact that you had this um, uh, ancient form of humans. This paper came out uh, a few years ago where they actually, back in 2002, and this is a wonderful paper because it, it what, it, what they did was they went back to that valley and they tried to find the site where those bones were found. Now, the, 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 the uh, topology of that valley had been completely destroyed. They'd, all the walls had been taken down. All the, so much uh, quarrying had gone on that they couldn't actually find that where that cave was anymore. But they went back and looked at, uh, at uh, 19th century paintings of, of the valley and they looked at the landmarks and they tried to triangulate and they actually managed to find where they thought that original um, specimen had been discovered. They started digging and they found more Neanderthal bones. Uh, and it gets even better than that because they actually found a bone in this survey that happened you know, nearly 150 years later that actually fitted like a piece of jigsaw, of a jigsaw puzzle, into one of the bones that was recovered back in the 1850s. So it's a remarkable story there that they actually recovered that. And they actually recovered some DNA, and I'll go on to that uh, in a moment. In fact, uh, since uh, the discovery of Neanderthals, there are over 400 specimens of this ancient form of humans that have been recovered in, in forms of skeletons, some of them more complete than others, plenty of, of skulls and so forth. And uh, the, the, these have been recovered from sites all over Europe uh, and I into the uh, Middle East as well. Um, you can see there that at the top there is the, is the kind of extent of glaciation, so you wouldn't expect to find them far in the far north of Europe, um, but there are sites. Uh, in fact, Neanderthal 
the valley is at the northern extent probably of the, of the, uh, uh, of the range that we see in Europe. And there have been some wonderful reconstructions. There's a very early picture here that was drawn, uh, and more recent ones that have been done in various museums at the University of Zurich as well. And you can see these very poignant reconstructions here of a Neanderthal child. Um, and and uh, it gives them a feel, you give you a feeling that these were real people uh, back in the, in the time. Now, when did they live? Well, the first uh, Neanderthal, proto Neanderthal features are seen in some skulls, I think, 350,000 years ago. But full blown Neanderthals are thought to have lived between 130 and 30,000 years ago. Seem to have died out in Africa by about 50,000 years ago, and they survived in Europe probably to about 24,000 years ago. And they overlapped in time and range with us. AMH stands for anatomically modern humans, i.e. skeletons that look just like our skeletons do and would fall clearly within the same species. It doesn't appear to be any clear evidence that they actually lived together at one site, overlapped or anything like that. Uh, but they certainly lived in Europe and in the Middle East at the same time. Now, they are anatomically distinct from us, from anatomically modern humans, in, in many different ways. Uh, in fact, the differences are, are probably larger than you'd see, say, between the common chimp and a bonobo, which we accept as different species of chimp. The Neanderthals are much more robust than us, you know, look like kind of rugby players or, you know, much big, bigger boned and more robust. They have this pronounced brow ridge, projecting mid face, this low, flat, elongated skull, and at the back of their head they have this bun that sticks out, known as the occipital bun, this little uh, swelling there. And they're kind of chinless, original chinless wonders, if you like. And in fact, the average brain size is perhaps just a few centimetres cube larger than ours. Um, so the idea that they were sort of primitive humans that were stupid, I mean, in terms of brain size, that's not true at all. What happened to them? Well, there was this coexistence for 15 or 20,000 years. What kind of things went on? Well, was, were they rendered extinct by us? Was it genocide that modern humans came and just killed them all? Maybe they ate them or whatever. Was it that they were just generally, just gradually uh, rendered incapable of competing with us? Uh, they, they just lost out. They couldn't adapt to the end of glaciation or one idea that's, that's gained a lot of prominence recently is that modern humans are, are adapted to run long distances. Maybe that was something that gave us an edge over them. An alternative idea is that they didn't die out. They just got assimilated into our population. Maybe we had a larger population than the Neanderthals just interbred and disappeared into, into the human population. So that triggers the question, actually, was there any genetic exchange between them and us, or at least people like us, our ancestors? Now, it's generally accepted. I, normally when I give these lectures to students, I actually make a, uh, we have a separate lecture about the out of Africa idea, that basically all humans that come from outside Africa are descended from a group of humans that left Africa and went into Eurasia. Um, there was, as far as we're aware, there wasn't any overlap between Neanderthals and, and modern humans in Africa, but maybe they did, over, uh, uh, maybe they did interbreed outside of Africa uh, in Eurasia. Or maybe they didn't. Maybe they just died out and that was it. So what can sequences tell us? Well, ancient DNA, we can look at that. What do, what do Neanderthal sequences look like? We can ask that question. We're going to amplify or retrieve sequences from fossils. As I mentioned before, we have this problem of contamination with human DNA. And the molecule that's favoured, that was initially favoured, at least in this field, uh, comes from a, a, a little organelle that we find inside our cells. In fact, it's a very unusual kind of bacterium that's made itself very much at home inside our cells called the mitochondrion. And this, was fa this is favoured because there are hundreds or thousands of copies of this particular organelle in each cell. And so the numbers of copies of its DNA is much higher than of the 
the nuclear genome, the genome that we normally think of as the human genome. There's also a region called the D-loop, which doesn't actually encode for any proteins, and therefore it is not under any kind of evolutionary, or much of an evolutionary constraint, so it varies quite a lot. So it's actually quite useful for doing comparisons between different groups of humans and looking at uh, relationships between them. The other thing is that this doesn't undergo recombination. It passes down the maternal line. So mother passes it on to daughter, passes it on to daughter, and sons are a dead end. Uh, so my, my mitochondrial DNA has not gone into my children. They've got my wife's. So this field really began in 1997, um, and this guy Svante Parbo, whose name is, is heard all the way through this field, through this work, he, he, he was uh, head of a team which attempted to get Neanderthal DNA sequences. And so they took a sample from the right humerus of a Neanderthal and they extracted DNA from it, and they, uh, they used an amplification technique to, to, to hoik out some DNA and they sequenced it. And what they found from that sequence was that the Neanderthal sequences were clearly distinct from all anatomically modern humans. And they drew a family tree, and you could see on the family tree that Neanderthals sit, sit outside. You've got Africans and non-Africans there uh, as one branch. The, the deepest branches are in Africa, as we know that humans evolved in Africa, and that's where they've lived longest. But Neanderthals are way outside that. And so the story went over seven or eight years. Uh, there were a progressive number of papers recovering mitochondrial DNA sequences from Neanderthals, and the consensus was, so here they've said analysis of 24 Neanderthals and 40. That they, the, the consensus was that the, the, the mitochondrial DNA says that there was no admixture. Some interesting things were found uh, following this line of work. They actually were able to find Neanderthals all the way over in Siberia and get mitochondrial DNA out of those, and they were able to show that there was actually variation among the Neanderthals in, in their mitochondrial DNA, and that the Siberian ones were uh, rather distantly related to the ones they'd found in, in Europe. Uh, but nonetheless, all of them were outside of the range of variation we see in modern humans. So, by 2007, this was the kind of picture we had. So at the top there, that CRS is called the Cambridge Re Reference Sequence. That's the human mitochondrial reference sequence. And then underneath are the uh, sequences that these are the sites which vary in Neanderthals. So you can see considerable evidence there that there is variation away from uh, the human sequences. Now, when this all started, you could have argued, well, maybe those that Neanderthal DNA is just degraded, and all you're seeing is the difference due to that degradation. But because we get a consistent picture from each of the specimens, and because people actually have recovered DNA from modern, anatomically modern humans that is tens of thousands of years old, and that looks like modern human DNA, that idea is now scotched, and we're actually saying that this is clear evidence that the mitochondrial variation in, in um, Neanderthals is quite different, is outside of all uh, anatomically modern humans. So the interpretation was, well, that's it. They're two separate species. They went down one path, we went down another. Although we might have overlapped in time and space a bit, there was no admixture, no funny business going on. Um, and this was consistent with the out-of-Africa hypothesis that probably pretty much all of us in this room are descendants of that small group of people uh, who left Africa uh, and people the rest of the world 60 to 70,000 years ago. But things changed uh, towards the end of the last decade, the second half of the last decade. In fact, in November 2006, there was this big fanfare in the scientific journals. Again, this is the guy, Svante Parbo, who was uh, leading it. What they did here was instead of looking at that, that just that mitochondrial DNA, they looked at the much bigger picture of the, what we call the nuclear genome that's got all your chromosomes uh, in it. Um, and they managed to uh, recover uh, substantial amounts of DNA. So uh, one million base pairs, basically one million letters of Neanderthal DNA that they could read. 
And these two papers came up back to back and they uh, tried to uh, plot out when humans and Neanderthals had diverged, compar com comparing things with chimpanzees. Um, and you can see that the figures are very rough and ready. They said that uh, modern humans, in the first one, modern humans and Neanderthals diverged about half a million years ago. In the second one, they say about 706 um, million years ago, or 370,000 years ago, depending on how they calculate it. What did they say, these two papers, about admixture? Well, I'm not expecting you to read all that, but basically they hedged their bets. One of them was saying that, um, that with these assumptions, the maximum likelihood estimate for Neanderthal contribution to modern genetic diversity is zero. But if we put confidence limits, we do some statistics, well, it could be zero. It could be as much as 20%, so we don't quite know. We need more data. Um, this one here, they, they were a bit more, they said, yeah, maybe there is some stuff in there that looks like human sequences in the Neanderthal sequence. Maybe there has been admixture, and we, but we still need more sequencing. Well, on Darwin's 200th birthday, February the 12th, there was a press release uh, from Santi Parvo's group where they said they had now achieved what and many people would have said would have been impossible just a few years before. They'd actually got a, a draft sequence of the whole Neanderthal genome at about what they call one, fo one fold coverage. So they, they've got as, mu as much DNA as there is in the whole genome. Now, as a matter of statistics, when they sample the genome, they don't actually get every base. They're going to get about 60% of the genome covered when they do that. But, but they, it was a tour de force. They sequenced you know, 68.9 billion bases, a huge amount of DNA. And, they, and most of that was just microbial. It was just things from the soil that the bone had been in and so on. But out of that, they extracted um, these three billion bases of, of Neanderthal genome. They, this is all from women, so they didn't have any Y chromosome sequences. But they were able to start saying, well, yeah, there's amino acid differences between anatomically modern humans and, and, uh, and Neanderthals. And as a kind of ranging thing, about 1,000 to, one th uh, to 2,000 amino acid differences in terms of the way in which proteins are made. And that compares with about 50 to 25-fold more in a chimpanzee in terms of difference. Now, they said then, with this press release, they found no evidence of admixture. Um, and uh, they came up with a divergence date around 800,000 years ago. So we were all waiting. Oh, a press release, you know, that's not science. Science is where you publish in a scientific journal and it's been peer-reviewed and looked at properly. And that finally did come. It came in, in 2010. Uh, and here we got a bit of a surprise because they showed that there were some genetic variants. Uh, there was some evidence that um, there was admixture. So what they did was they, this is getting a bit technical, but they, com they compared parts of the Neanderthal genome and, and, mon and modern humans that were different from chimpanzees, and they showed, uh, and they compared that with two European Americans, two East Asians, two West Africans. And what they found was that there was evidence that Neanderthals were significantly closer to the non-Africans that they looked at. And they compared them with... Uh, a larger group, they included San, which are the, sometimes known as the Bushmen. Uh, these are a very early diverging group of humans that you find in southern Africa. Yoruba, these are West Africans. The Han is the general name for the Chinese uh, eth ethnic group. French and, and Papua New Guineans. And they basically showed that what had happened was that there had indeed been gene flow from Neanderthals to non-African humans. Um, Craig Venter was uh, the first human to have his individual genome done, rather vain man that did it himself as part of his company, and there are parts of him that are more Neanderthal than they are African. Um, so they were putting a range of a few percent, one to one to four percent there. So this was a bit of a surprise uh, because we could have accepted that there would be admixture in Europe and that maybe Europeans were a bit more Neanderthal than the rest of humanity. But it was a bit of a surprise to discover that all out of Africans were um, 
had this Neanderthal admixture. So Chinese, Papuans, um, and so it's clear that what must have happened is that this admixture must have happened just as humans were leaving Africa, or just after they left Africa, or it's possible that maybe there was Neanderthal overlap with humans in Africa just before they left, although there's no fossil evidence, as I say, of Neanderthals in Ethiopia or those parts of Africa where they're thought to have exited from. So that was a bit of a turn-up, uh, quite a surprise. Now, interestingly, you can actually do more with this DNA than just say, well, there's been some admixture. Having this Neanderthal genome, people have said, all right, let's go and have a look and see if we can actually tell anything about what Neanderthals were like from their genes. So this paper was one of the early papers where they looked at a, um, a gene that's involved in pigmentation in humans. And they showed that there was a particular mutation in that gene which changed the protein that the gene encodes. And they made the um, deduction that this gene, if you mutate it in modern humans, you see it mutated in modern humans, it's associated with pale skin color and red hair. Now, the variation they saw in Neanderthals was not ever, it's not been seen in any modern human, but it was of a kind similar to what you see in red-haired people with pale skin. And so they made the uh, prediction that Neanderthals had, some Neanderthals at least, maybe not all, but some Neanderthals had uh, pale skin and red hair. And there's been a, a range of other um, papers looking at these kind of easy hits, things that you can easily derive. So there is a particular gene that allows us to taste certain bitter tastes. And if you have mutations in that gene, you can't taste the bitter taste. And, th and they were able to show that Neanderthals had um, that particular you know, capability. Also, it was possible to reconstruct the blood groups of Neanderthals, the ABO blood groups, uh, using this ancient DNA. And one particular gene that's been very much of interest in terms of the evolution of humans and language, they were able to show that, that, that Neanderthals were the same as us in that gene. So it was kind of inching towards understanding what Neanderthals are like from their genome. Now, I've, I've been teaching this stuff. I, I'm, I'm a microbiologist and I study microbial genomes, but I got st to start teaching this genomic stuff, well, human genome evolution, about five years ago, and it's been a roller coaster because every year new things come out. And it was amazing to see the story with Neanderthals go from, yeah, we can get mitochondrial DNA, to, but they're not the same as that, they're not interbred, to having a whole nuclear genome, and yes, they did interbreed. But in 2010, something even more amazing came out, which was that they found a finger bone in a cave in Siberia, in this so called Denisova cave. Uh, that didn't look like, didn't, they didn't think it was um, modern human. They found some teeth as well. And they extracted DNA. Initially, they got mitochondrial DNA, and they said, hang on, this mitochondrial DNA looks unlike any modern human DNA. and doesn't even look much like Neanderthal DNA. So we have evidence of another lineage, which we've never seen in the fossil record, or at least we don't know what it looks like in the fossil record, but that is kind of co-equal with modern humans and Neanderthals in human uh, diversity. So you can see number 62 in the middle there is where the cave was. And you can see this so-called Denisova DNA coming in the family tree. You've got all, the, all those anatomically modern humans there. Uh, you can see all these Africans and then you've got all these out of Africans in one branch there. You've got the Neanderthals, but even further out you've got this Denisova DNA as a branch there. And uh, a short while later, another year or so later, they actually managed to then get the whole genome. In fact, they got 1.9-fold coverage of this genome. Um, and then they discovered something equally mind-boggling, which was that this lineage appeared to have contributed to the ancestry of some modern humans as well. But it was to the ancestor. What they found was that there was a signature in Melanesians uh, from the islands in the Pacific Ocean that um, suggested that they'd had about four to six percent of their DNA coming in from this lineage. They were, they were actually living thousands of miles away from Siberia, 
And so humans coming through Eurasia, there must have been some kind of interbreeding with these Denisovans, and then they went off to people, Melanesia, Australian Aborigines, all those, they have this signature, which was a, a weird finding coming from, um, just from DNA. And this is one of those issues where, you know, we were talking earlier about Alice Roberts, that uh, you know, we had a bit of joshing, she mentioned, oh, it's just a finger bone. I said, it's maybe just a finger bone to you, but it's a whole genome to me. This is actually you know, clear evidence of a, of a whole new lineage that we didn't know about before. And so, you know, we now can look at these two lineages. We've got Neanderthals. We've also got these Denisovans coming into that lineage, leading to the Papua New Guineans and Australian Aboriginals and so on. And so when we look at the kind of evolution of humans, it's a very uh, muddled kind of view now. So we have our own species, Homo sapiens, emerging in Africa and then spreading across the globe into Eurasia. But you have also... Uh, these other lineages of Denisovans and Neanderthals coming in and then giving some admixture. Now some people would say, oh, well, this is the end of the out of Africa theory, we shouldn't say that we're all descendants of these people coming out of Africa. The point is, it's only a few percent, 95% plus of us is still from those African, uh, those, a those ancestors that left Africa, but a small percentage is nonetheless Neanderthal or, or Denisovan, well, not in us, but in Papua New Guineans is Denisovan. So we now have multiple mitochondrial sequences all outside the range of human variation. Then we, we do have small-scale mixing. We have some evidence about what Neanderthals are like. We have evidence of these other, they're now talk, called archaic lineages, uh, and we have ad, ad, admixture from Denisovans. There does appear to be, when you look at modern genetic variation, also some evidence there might have been another population in Africa that we haven't yet identified that might have contributed some sequences. So we're in a very interesting time in this field. It really is a roller coaster from year to year. New findings are coming in. Now, what I'm going to do now for the last uh, 10, 15 minutes is just um, talk about something different. And this is looking at plague. So this is, these are images illustrating uh, the effect of the Black Death in Europe, which is perhaps the most famous uh, incarnation of, of, of bubonic plague. Um, here's a an illustration of the kind of buboes, these swellings you get. Uh, here is a typical medieval obsession with death because so many people died. It's estimated around a third of the people in, in Europe died. This is a peasant's revolt, which was part of uh, the social upheaval that followed the Black Death. And here is a plague pit. Uh, so when people were dying in such large numbers, they didn't have time for the ceremony of normal burial and so forth. They just chucked all the dead into a pit uh, together. And this, uh, taken from Wikipedia, actually shows the spread of the Black Death through Europe in the 1340s and 1350s. And you can see it progressively came from the east, uh, moved through into the Mediterranean region, and then into northern Europe. Um, and by the 1850s, it, it hit us here in, 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 um, in the UK. Now, plague is caused by an organism called Yersinia pestis. This is a bacterium. This is a bit of a technical slide, I apologise. There's a, uh, a mammalian reservoir. It actually lives in rats and other kind of rodents. But there's also these spreading hosts, which are fleas. And the fleas mediate transmission from one to another. And the organism has these special characteristics of being able to invade the blood and the tissues of the mammalian host. And it seems to have had increased virulence to do that. Now, it appears that it is related to other uh, bacteria in the same genus which don't do that, which actually are gastrointestinal pathogens. And it seems to have evolved this special capacity to spread via fleas and live in the bloodstream. Now, the first study is to try and reconstruct what happened with plague <coughs> and how it evolved. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, come from this guy, Mark Achtman. Um, and he, a bit like Svante Parbo for the Neanderthal story, is one of the guys that's done most of the work in this area. And what he did in, in an early study was he, he looked at a number of strains and he looked at just little bits of sequence. And he 
came out with this, they came up with this idea that actually the organism that causes plague is very much a specialised form of a much more general organism called Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. So one little lineage of pseudotuberculosis among many just acquired a couple of extra virulence factors and just changed itself very subtly to become this new pathogen. Now, it, it, it had been described in the, in the previous literature that there were actually three kinds of variety of this organism that you could identify in the lab um, called Antiqua Medievalis and Orientalis. And this idea had got in the literature that these three different varieties were responsible for three what we call pandemics, three times in which this organism swept across the world. The first time was the so-called Justinian Plague, where it decimated the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. And in fact, probably as a result of that, the, the, the damage to those societies, the Arabs were able to spread and bring Islam uh, into um, that part of the world because the, the societies were no longer robust enough to survive. We had the Black Death uh, in the 1340s or 1350s, followed by the Peasants' Revolt, and then there was also this uh, final third pandemic which um, spread out of Hong Kong and around the world in, in the last 150 years or so. Now, they, they initially said, okay, so these three different variants, they actually, they were the what, three different variants that caused these different plagues. A few years later, he then, they, they took a lot more data and they actually changed their view and they said, well, actually, those, that's a bit too simplistic. And in fact, we now recognize eight populations. They found some variants that were found only in animals that formed an ancient form. Um, they kind of drew this family tree. Uh, and they, they reckon that maybe that there would have been several thousand years of evolution of Yersinia pestis as a human pathogen causing plague, or at least as a, uh, uh, in the modern form um, before, before the present day. But then uh, people actually started looking at archaeological remains, and there were a number of, a whole range of papers showing that you could recover DNA from those remains, initially going back just a couple of centuries, and then eventually going back to the Black Death. And this is one such paper where they actually were, you can see Mark Ackman is on there as well, where they showed that, in fact, they could recover DNA, and it were, they could sequence it, and they could show that it was distinct from the modern variant, so it wasn't this, this idea of Orientalis and Medievalis and so forth, it was actually uh, more ancient than that and appeared to be the, the ancestor of those modern forms. Um, and they looked at uh, the spread, uh, they, they looked at these uh, various sites, including one not far from here in Hereford, and they, they managed to get from plague pits uh, uh, DNA from, usually from the teeth. So one of the the place when you get this thing spreading through the blood and it gets sealed off in teeth and the teeth kind of acts like a time capsule and they're able to recover DNA from the bacterium from that. And they drew a family tree that looked like this. Um, and the, what they said was that what they'd found in Hereford was actually the ancestral point of the modern variants that Archie recognises causing plague. Now that's slightly odd because you sort of think, well, if that was Black Death, then what was the Justinian Plague? Because that would have been earlier. So why were we seeing the ancestor of all the modern forms in the Black Death? Well, just in the, in the last year or so, we've now actually got a whole genome of this bacterium recovered from these Black Death victims. And this, again, confirms that idea when they looked at, uh, when they tried to draw a family tree and work out what this... Uh, Black Death genome looked like, it again looked like very much like the ancestor of all the modern forms of plague that have been collected from all around the world. And when they tried to work out, calibrate when that was, they said it was about the time um, that, that, that all these things would have converged about, convert, converged about the time of the Black Death. So we're now actually in a situation where it's um, slightly murky as to what's gone on here. It, it looks, we've got this genome, it looks as if plague emerged as the Black Death, as we know it, modern plague, and we don't know what caused the Justinian plague. There are a couple of reports where people have said that they've got Yersinia pestis DNA from victims of the Justinian plague, but whether those are 
true or that's contamination, it w only time will tell, I, I guess. But to me, it's quite amazing that we've managed to actually capture this organism that caused the Black Death in silico, if you like. We've actually got its DNA sequence, and we can look at it and analyse it. Right, the last couple of minutes, uh, I said I would, I, I, in the title, I said reconstruction of places, and I've forgotten I've done that until this afternoon. I've just added a couple of slides to mention another interesting area, which is the study of sedimentary ancient DNA. So what we've spoken about up to now is actually recovering DNA from fossils that you can see. They're obvious fossils. But in fact, if you just take a sediment uh, and extract DNA from it, can you learn anything? Well, it turns out you can. Uh, it seemed a bit of a long shot, but it does seem that you can actually, uh, that DNA is released from plants and animals into the sediments, and even if the fossils uh, perish and are not there, you can detect that DNA. And you can do that in two ways. You can say, I want to look for a, you know, DNA from an oak tree or from a sheep. Or, I, or you can just sequence all the DNA that's there and just see what you find. And that's called metagenomics. There have been probably about, well, between half a dozen and a dozen such studies which have just about established now that this technique does work. Uh, one of the most interesting, perhaps, is this one called The Farm Beneath the Sand, where they went to Greenland. So Greenland was settled by the Vikings for a period of years, I think over a decade, uh, over a century. Um, and they lived there and they had their animals there and then they died out. And um, the, the, the only uh, people who lived in Greenland at the time, it was rediscovered by modern Europeans, were, were the Inuit, the, the Vikings had died out there. Um, and what they did was they went to this particular site um, and they went and just dug up sediments from the field um, uh, and they worked out uh, the timing using conventional archaeological approaches as to you know, when those sediments, what, what years they equated to. And then they did, uh, they analysed uh, DNA extracted from those samples and they showed here you can see the proportion of reads that they got, DNA sequences that they got. And the, the, the interesting point is that they got cattle and sheep and goats uh, from the time that the Vikings were there. But then by 1450 to 1520, they didn't get anything. They just got human DNA, which is probably just contamination. Uh, it's either contamination or it, it may have been Inuit, but it, there was no evidence of, 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 wild stock, uh, of livestock there. And so this was quite a nice uh, finding that they could actually see and, and similar things have been seen, for example, in New Zealand, where they looked at the sediments outside a cave and they could find moa DNA, an extinct bird DNA, all the time up until the Maoris arrived and then the Maoris kind of wiped the moa out. Uh, and then, hum uh, then um, um, Europeans arrived and brought uh, um, sheep and they found sheep.